Hello and welcome to The Costin Show. My name is Bethany Criswell. And I'm Roland J. Costin Criswell. Today, we have a great show planned for you. With us, we have Lisa Upshur from the Center for Oregon Recovery and Education, better known as CORE. But up first, we have Roland Costin Criswell with his pre-need segment for today. So when we come back, we will hear from Roland with the pre-need. Can I go to the sleepover? Lucy, I want you to promise me something. If there's any drinking, I want you to say, no thanks, not my thing. Mom! I promise you, your real friends won't care. Deal? I promise, Mom. They really do hear you. Did you pack your toothbrush? For tips on how to start the talk, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. A public service message from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We've got a big problem, and we need your help. It's called sexual assault, and it has to stop. We have to stop it. So listen up. If she doesn't consent, or if she can't consent... It's a crime. It's wrong. We need all of you to be part of the solution. This is about respect. It's about responsibility. It's up to all of us to put an end to sexual assault. And that starts with you. Because one is too many. Welcome back to The Costin Show. Today, we're going to discuss on our pre need portion of the show, things to remember. Things to remember, what is that? That's when you're making pre need arrangements at a funeral home or you're making at need arrangements. At need is when someone has currently passed away and you have to go and handle the arrangements for a loved one. Pre need is when you're preparing, but whether it's pre need or at need, things to remember is information that you need to begin to gather together. This is information that we always share with our clients that prepare yourself for the funeral arrangements process. First and foremost, what you need to gather together is your vital, st vital statistic information. Your vital statistic information is what is used to uh, put together the death certificate for your loved one. What goes on a death certificate or what type of vital statistic information am I talking about? First and foremost will be something such as your date of birth. What's your date of birth? Also, what city you were born in? You all would be surprised about how many individuals who are in, the make, in a funeral home to make funeral arrangements who don't know the city that someone was born in. A lot of times people are born in the South and they may have been uh, born in their home and the uh, birth occurred in a home, but later on a family went to the county seat to record were or to record that someone was born. So as far as the consistency of exactly what city that person was born in, it's unknown. So this is something you want to discuss, especially if you're from the South, discuss with your family where you were born at. Your vital statistic information will also include information like what's the highest level of education you completed in school, what your father's name was, what your mother's first name and what her maiden name was. This is information that you can sit down together and have some fun with your family, telling your family their history, saying to one of your children, well, did you know that my mother's first name and maiden name was this and our family is from this location or that location? So have some fun with it. In addition to the vital statistic information, you want to have your cemetery property information together. If you own property at the cemetery, make sure you have the paperwork. It's no good if you have cemetery property that you own, but you don't have the actual paperwork. What I would suggest is make a copy of that paperwork, give it to a family member, and also if you have a funeral home already picked out, give it to the funeral home so that they can have it on file. Cemeteries or organizations, and they're not perfect, sometimes they misplace information. So make sure you have your cemetery information on paper. If you don't have it on paper, call the cemetery and ask them to send you a copy of your information. Clothing. Now this is something that's major. When you're going to be buried, you're getting yourself prepared or preparing a loved one for a funeral. And it's not every day that you prepare for a funeral. So a lot of times people will bring funeral homes clothing that is inappropriate. Mainly this is the case for women because for men it's pretty straightforward. Men, mainly we dress in suits, so a suit is a suit. But for women, something that she would wear as a um, as a ball gown or something that she uh, wore maybe out for dinner, that's not really appropriate for a funeral. So when you think about what is 
proper funeral attire and just think about something that's formal. Um, it could still be jazzy, it could still be fun, but it's not something that you would wear every day. A lot of people would say, well, you know, we don't want to dress mom or I don't want him to be dressed in something that looks like I'm being buried in. Well, guess what? You're being buried. So you want to make sure that it's appropriate dress, something that's long sleeve, something that is not sheer. I don't know if people ever recognize it, but you don't pretty much ever see deceased individual skin. Why? Because we cover up individual skin. Sometimes people have um, IVs in their arms. Sometimes people were in accidents where we need to cover their arms and things. So uh, just keep in mind, we want something that's long sleeve and that has a high neckline when it comes to clothing. What else should you uh, prepare to bring to the funeral home for at need or pre-need? Military. If you are a veteran or if you're married to a veteran, have that DD-214. That is an honorable discharge. Uh, the military or the government calls it a form DD2-14. That's helpful to have. If you don't have it, contact the National Archives or your Veterans Administration and they'll assist you with acquiring that. Also, you want to have insurance paperwork. If you have an insurance policy, you should have the paperwork or the policy. If you don't have the policy, at least have a policy number. On that policy or a statement, you want to have what the face amount is and who the beneficiary is. Lastly, a picture. This is a lot of times oversight as far as families are trying to find a picture of a loved one or someone didn't take a lot of pictures or you might have a picture that you think that is just a great picture of you. Set that picture aside and tell your family, hey, if something were to happen to me, this is the picture that I want to be used. We want a nice picture. It's always nice to have a picture of every stage of someone's life. When my grandfather, Samuel E. Costin, died, that did something different, I think. I took a picture from every stage of his life and put it in the newspaper. So on one day, it was a picture from like his 20s. The next day, it was a picture I uh, ran in the newspaper from like his 40s. And then the next day, a picture ran when he was like in his 70s. So someone may, may have knew my grandfather when he was in his 20s or 30s, and they saw that picture and recognized him. And then the next stage of the life, we had a picture for every stage of his life. So you want to identify some pictures that you want your family members to have as go-to pictures that they can use if you were to pass away. Thank you for joining us for this week's pre sec segment. After the break, we're going to come back with the Center for Oregon Recovery and Education. I have a promise to be a doctor. I have a promise to be a chef. Did you know that what children learn before kindergarten affects how well they will do in school and even what they might be when they grow up? Early education is so important to children's success in school and in life. Talking, reading, and playing with children from birth builds the language, math, and social skills they need to be ready for kindergarten. Choosing quality early learning programs like Keystone Stars, Pre-K Counts, Head Start, Early Intervention, Nurse Family Partnership, and Parent-Child Home Program provides children with good teachers and learning activities that spark creativity and a love for learning so they can grow and develop. You can help Pennsylvania's young children reach their promise. To learn more, get involved, and tell your story, visit PAPromiseForChildren.com. Because every child is Pennsylvania's future. Welcome back to The Costin Show. Joining us on set is Lisa Upshur from the Center for Oregon Recovery and Education, better known as CORE. Welcome, Lisa, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to have an opportunity to talk with you all about a very special need in the minority and multicultural community. Well, thank you for joining us, Lisa. Why don't we start out and uh, find out what you do at uh, CORE and how you got started there. Okay, great. I am the MOTAP Program Director, and MOTAP stands for Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program. My focus is on the multicultural and faith-based community, and that is basically to get education and people to register to be an organ donor in those communities, something that is very direly needed. Uh, currently, we have over 127,000 people that are waiting for transplants every day. 18 to 20 people die, and every 12 to 15 minutes, a person is added to that list. Currently, the African-American community leads that list as far as needing transplants. 
Okay, so you talked about um, the African Americans leading the, the way on that list. Can you uh, tell us some of the myths or some of the miscommunication that might be out there uh, for people who want to donate their organs? Absolutely. Uh, currently, with the African American community and multi community as a whole, we lead the list as far as having diabetes and hypertension as a current health disparity. And with that, the myths and misconceptions myths and misconceptions that have been passed on from generation, basically just fear, uh, lack of communication and education on importance of organ donation. Uh, basically people are just basically afraid of it. They feel that if someone signs up to be an organ donor, they're going to let them die. Uh, a lot of times when I have uh, conversations with people, they say, oh, I'm taking all my organs with me. And it's <laughs> like, well, we know that that is not true. They're going to go back to the dirt and not help anyone. So basically what we want people to do is think about being a living legacy and making that pledge of life to help someone else after their life has ended. Now, you mentioned that African Americans lead the list as far as needing organ donations. Um, is there uh, a correlation between race and the donors as far as, like, does someone's race make them uh, more eligible to donate to someone within their own race, does it matter or? No, it doesn't matter okay. at all. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, the problem is that there's just not enough organs to go around okay. at this point. And it doesn't matter on what race you are, it's based on blood type. Blood type, okay. So therefore, we're able to help each other regardless of what our race is. Now, are African Americans more likely to have the same blood type as other African Americans? Does, does that matter? No, it doesn't okay. matter at all. Uh, and at this point in life and how the transplants are going, most of the time Caucasians are the ones that are saving African Americans' lives because African Americans are most likely to need a transplant, but they are least likely to sign up to be an organ donor. Okay. So now, um, just taking it back one step, what, can you tell our viewers what exactly is an, an organ donor? Well, organ donor is someone that has signed up on their driver's license and gave legal consent that they would, after their life is over, they would like to save someone else's life. And that's basically what an organ donor is. There's eight organs that can save other people's lives, and they, if someone does tissue or cornea, they can help up to 50 people as uh, far as uh, enhancing their lives. Now also, um, I've read on your website, there are different types of um, deaths as far as um, like if you're in a car accident or um, if you're brain dead, can you just explain the dip, like how you're able to take the organs from different types of scenarios of death? Basically, most people that are organ donors die from brain death, and that's a traumatic injury to the brain. Um, and when you sign up to be an organ donor, you need to talk to your family, say this is something that I want to do as far as being a gift to someone else. Um, when you're talking about the different scenarios, you can die from brain death. Most cases, people don't understand that you have to die within the hospital. Okay. Uh, they're not going to let you die. Uh, they say, oh, I'm in an accident. They're not going to help me. They're going to just let me die. No, that, that doesn't work at all. What happens is if a person has had a major injury, they're in the hospital, they're having oxygen uh, supplied to their body and their brain death, and brain death is basically no more oxygen going to the brain. They're not in a coma, they're not sleeping, they're not in a vegetative state. The brain has ceased to function. And it's interesting because only 2% die brain deaths. Mm. So wow. therefore, see, the limit as far as people being, having the opportunity to be an organ donor is very slim. Now, if people wanted to become an organ donor, I know you can you sign up when you get your driver's license. Mm -hmm. Is that the only way that you? No, okay. you can go on CORE's website, www.core.org, and you can sign up at home. Okay. And it's also important to uh, let your family, I know you mentioned that it's important to let your family members know that you have decided to be an organ donor. As Absolutely, well. uh, because you know this is legal and it is binding and you need to have your family be aware of what your wishes are. Mm -hmm. uh, because in most cases this is a traumatic experience, this is an unexpected death, so you want your family to have a clear head that if something should happen to me, this is something I would like to do. I want to be an organ donor. I want to help someone else if I can. 
Lisa, what area does CORE cover, the Center for Organ Recovery and Education, as far as, um, is it just Pittsburgh, is it just Allegheny County? What region does CORE cover? CORE actually is very large. We cover southwestern Pennsylvania, we cover Chemung County in New York, and we cover all of West Virginia except for 10 counties. Within that, we have 155 hospitals within our network, and it covers about 6 million people. Well, that's a lot of people. That Absolutely. Um, now, when talking about the organs, can you tell our viewers like what ex what exact organs do you actually use or take from someone who is donating their organs? The eight organs would be you have two lungs, you have two kidneys, your liver, your pancreas, small intestine. Uh, those would be the organs, and naturally your heart uh, mm -hmm. would be the organs that would help save someone else's life. Now, what about skin? Like, do you also use like skin tissue or anything? We use cornea, and we also do use tissue, okay. uh, and those are very much enhancements for someone that has lost sight, or if someone's a burn victim. Those are a lot of the cases where tissue is used. Well, Lisa, thank you for coming on the Costa Show. Uh, when we come back from the break, can you discuss with us uh, some of the uh, opportunities individuals may have as far as working with CORE in the future? I know we have a lot of young viewers who may be interested in a um, profession in the organ transplantation field. So whether it's being a pathologist, whether it's being someone who has a funeral directing background and working in the lab, whether it's working in the office, when we come back, can you share some of that? Absolutely. All right. All right, we'll be right back after this quick break and we'll have more with Lisa. Did you know that every two seconds someone in the U.S. needs blood transfusions? Blood donations save over 4.5 million American people every year because there is no substitute for human blood and it helps you as well as a donor. You can get rid of the toxic amounts of iron levels in your blood by donating blood today. Donate now and save lives. Jimmy can't sing and Tommy can't dance. So we're, we're gonna, gonna put some hands in their pants. Aww. Kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the super duper party troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants, they got ants in their pants. They've got ants in their pants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Welcome back to The Costin Show. Today we have with us from the so Center for Organ Recovery and Education, Lisa Upshur. Lisa, before we went to the break, I asked that when we came back you would tell us about some opportunity in a profession of organ uh, donation. What, what opportunities are available? Oh, there are a vast number of uh, opportunities in the world of organ donation for as nurses. Uh, we had spoke before for someone that has a funeral director background. Uh, we have administrative jobs. We have public health jobs. There are a lot of opportunities in a lot of different fields that are encompassed in organ donation. Um, Lisa, um, in addition to being able to donate your organs, I, I did notice that you all also do research as well for uh, donor, donor research. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, basically with all of the health issues that are, we're having now with, you know, the hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, genetic predisposed uh, disorders, uh, it gives an opportunity if a person uh, is not able to donate their organs for to save lives in that uh, genre, they can also save lives in research. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea because you always do want to stay on the cutting edge of technology Absolutely. as well as learning new ways to deal with different diseases. Um, what about living donation? Living donation is exciting because a normal person when they need a transplant, we'll give an example for kidney, they may stay on the list for a minimum of four to six years before they get a transplant. If they have a living donor, someone that is a perfect match for them, they don't have to go on the list and they can receive their kidney right away. So when we're talking about living donation, you have a loved one or a relative or a friend of the family that could be a donor to them. Uh, you have paired donation where if you're not a match, 
uh, they will find someone that matches that person that has agreed to be a donor and matches you also at the same time. So therefore, that cuts down time on the wait list. And they also have where perfect strangers have decided to do something good for society, and they step up and they say, we would like to just donate a kidney for someone to have an opportunity at life. That's always nice to be able to help someone else's life. Um, Absolutely. Live a better life. Um, can you tell us what's up next for CORE and some of the initiatives and events that you all have coming up? It's Gospel Idol. This is our second <laughs> time doing this and in our West Virginia uh, we have a call out now for people to be uh, signing up to compete to be an organ donor, not an organ donor, but to to get information out about being on Gospel Idol and okay. again as far as organ donation is it is another education forum for us. Mm -hmm. That sounds like fun. And this is your second year doing the, the Gospel Idol? Well, actually, this will be the second time this year. We did it okay. in Pittsburgh in February for Black History Month, and it was amazing. I mean, you know, we had over 500 people come out. We had great competition. And again, like I say, it's a different way to do education on a different type of forum. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone's interested in Gospel Idol or any of your other initiatives, how would they get in contact with you? Please go on www.core.org. Uh, or you can call us at 1-800-DONOR uh, and get that information. Well, but the website great. would be the great place to be. Now before you go, Lisa, I do want to touch on a few of the myths that people do and misconceptions that people have out there on being, becoming an organ donor. Um, one of them is, I am too old to register to become an organ donor. Is that true? It's never too old. We always tell people just please sign up and let them medically re, um, rule you out. Like we were talking before, if you can't be an organ donor that way, you can possibly help us in research. So there's never an age limit on that. Um, what about this next one? Uh, my organs aren't of any value because of my medical illnesses. Again, we ask for you to just sign up and let them medically rule you out. Uh, with organ donation, that's the key. You need to just sign up, go through the process, after your life is over, you have opportunity to help someone in several different ways, and that would be research or giving the gift of life. Can someone specify what organs they want to donate? When you sign up on www.core.org or you sign on your DMV, you say, if I have anything that someone else can use, please let them have it. And also, do, do they ever meet or is the identity ever known about who you gave your organs to or as far as your living well no I take that back um, are you able to be identified to the person that you donated your organs to everything is confidential okay. in the beginning but we do have a process where they are allowed to communicate with each other and if they do decide that they would like to meet core intervenes and becomes the liaison to help them do that so yes, they do have an opportunity. Okay. And then they develop their own relationships outside of that meeting. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you came on today because on a costume show, we try to educate our audience about um, some of the great things and some of the great uh, organizations within our community. And I do want to say that CORE is, is a good program and we're happy that we have CORE in Western Pennsylvania, um, in my opinion, or Western Pennsylvania, but in New York as well as West, West Virginia. Um, with the great medical facilities, I'm sure CORE is one of the leading um, organ transplant organizations in the nation. Would you Absolutely. Say? Okay. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having us. Any opportunity that we can do public awareness and education in the community is a gift and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we thank you again, Lisa, for joining us today on The Cost and Show and sharing with our viewers all this wealth of information. Once again, we want to give the web, web address again. Please, www.core.org. All right, well, thank you, and we will be right back. Um, stay tuned. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We're gonna beat them and bust them. 
The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. Welcome back and thank you so much for joining us this week on The Cost and Show. We hope you enjoyed our guest, Ms. Lisa Upshur from CORE. Um, I definitely want to thank all of our fans out there for sending us messages on our Facebook page. And our Facebook page is at The Cost and Show. So that's at T-H-E-C-O-S-T-O-N-S-H-O-W. So thank you so much for sending all of those questions as well as different topics and also sending us suggestions on different guests that we could potentially have on our show. A lot of the information that we've gone over, you can always find at our website, www.costonfuneralhome.com. Once again, that's www.costonfuneralhome.com. Or you can check us out on Twitter at at costonfh. Once again, that's at costonfh. I always say costin is spelled like Boston, but just what they see. Thank you for joining us this week and join us next, next week on The Costin Show. Thank you, everybody.